Hi, I'm Bill. Hey, I'm Andy. And I'm Patrick. And you're watching Astro Chat on the Astro Vagabond channel. Thanks for joining. Um, before we get started, Andy's our guest tonight, and he's going to uh, cover several topics. But before we get into that, I just want to mention that uh, we're continuing to do outreach, outreach to find volunteers to come and participate in Astro Chat. It's, again, the goal is to use what we learned uh, to help uh, people that are new to the hobby, on, where they're in their beginning uh, phases of getting up the learning curve. So we think that we have an opportunity to help uh, others uh, through this process, so we'd sure like uh, you to get engaged. Uh, we also have a couple of uh, guests coming up. We have uh, er, uh, Lee Poulin, who's in the UK. Uh, he will be giving us a perspective of what it's like to image in the UK, where sometimes weather, weather conditions are not the best and you have to make the most of your time. I believe he also has a site which uh, we'll share with links and everything, uh, Urban Astrophotography. Uh, so we'll, we'll highlight some of his work in that. And then I reached out to Charles Bracken, the author of the Deep Sky Imaging Primer, and uh, Charlie has agreed to come on. So we're working out on the uh, scheduling right now. And uh, if you're not aware, and if you are on the beginning phases of your journey, the Deep Sky Imaging Primer, uh, I found to be a very helpful book. And it, covers a broad range of things that helps uh, help me get a good foundation underneath me in the beginning. So, all right. Uh, anybody else want to point anything out of, uh, no? Uh, we're also going to be working with uh, Andy uh, in a future episode as well, but we'll re reveal more of that uh, later uh, as we, uh, later in the Astro Chat series. And we, after the first of the year, we may try a uh, live stream uh, Astro Chat, so we can have uh, viewer participation, uh, field questions, and those type of things. So we'll have more on that in uh, future uh, episodes of Astro Chat. All right, I've talked too much. Now it's uh, Andy's <laughs> turn. <laughs> hey, so yeah, I'm Andy Weeks. Uh, you've probably seen my channel. I have zero videos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I actually have I'm a at. follower, which I, I didn't even check to see who it is. Uh, but anyway, I've, I've enjoyed, um, you know, watching uh, Bill, you, your growth, uh, you know, through the very beginning. I actually followed you very early on. There's, there's like uh, maybe 80. Well, because the, what really interested me is that we have parallel equipment, and we were paralleling each other on upgrades. Oh, wow. In, in Optics uh, 61. So, yeah, it was really kind of fun to, to kind of, uh, I was walking through it in the background the same time you were, and sometimes a little bit ahead, too. But, yeah, yeah. so uh, as far as uh, my background goes, uh, I actually started imaging with film back in the day. Um, so, and then I took a long break uh, while my kids were growing up, and I just got back into the hobby in 2018 again. Um yeah, so, uh, you know, much much like when people are starting out, I started out again in 2018 very slowly, building up my equipment slow over time. I just started with camera and tripod, uh, Canon 6D, you know, and I went to Sedona, Arizona, took some just stuff that blew me away. I didn't, didn't even know you could really do, you know, wow. just on a tripod. Um, and then I went to uh, a Skyguider Pro and, you know, and did that for a year and a half and, you know, just slowly added on equipment. And, uh, you know, you've heard it on this channel a bunch of times if you watched it. But that's really the way to go is just to start off slow, max out your capabilities with what you have instead of trying to jump to the, the, the next greatest camera or whatever. And, uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah I've uh, I think in the description uh, they'll have some of my you know my my photography that's in there. Yeah, my... we're uh, there'll be links uh, on how to reach and what, what you know where Andy's content is, and so uh, in the uh, video description. So be sure and check it out. And while Andy doesn't have a channel, 
I just want to use it to highlight that that is part of the thinking in my mind is sometimes uh, as an imager you might not have the time to create your own channel and manage it and everything but you want to share some information Astro Chat's the way to do it and uh, mm -hmm. you know and if you have a channel feel free to come in promote it promote your blog website whatever uh, that's how I think we can leverage the Astro Chat series uh, and uh, Hopefully you'll, uh, I'm doing a little outreach right here at Andy's yeah. expense, but, uh, you know, Andy, yeah. I wanted to point out that I've talked to a lot of visual astronomers who kind of got, while they didn't do the film, uh, astrophotography, um, they did visual and then a family popped up. And so they yeah. kind of had to put it to the side for a while. Right. And then as the family gets grown up, they start to get a little bit better control of their time. And then they start, uh, back at the hobby. So. Uh, I think many, many people have come uh, through that path, probably. So, yeah, for sure, right. So uh, you're going to do a little bit on the, um, you know, I've been, I've been sharing your presentation from the Fox Valley Astronomical Society on uh, cloudy nights, because uh, there's constant filter questions. And, you know, I think your, your presentation that would have really been helpful to me on the front end, you know, I'm two years in now. But uh, so I think you're going to share a little bit from that, mm -hmm. if I understand. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, one thing uh, just before we get started in that, uh, one of the things I, I definitely want to share, and I don't know, Bill, you've shared it. Simon has shared it. And I can't remember, Patrick, you probably have too. But um, it's really, I think it's really important uh, for, for to get involved in an astronomy, astronomy society or club. Yeah. Um, you know, in our club here in, in uh, the Fox Valley of Illinois, you know, and I'm from Batavia, and then there's Geneva St. Charles. And uh, uh, being able to interact with other people like Bill, you know, you've shared on your, your channel by going to the dark sites and talking to people and whatnot. Um, and, and for me, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm more at the... Uh, I don't want to say expert because I don't know if you ever become an expert in this hobby. <laughs> um, but I've, I've been doing it for five years, so I've got a good handle on it. And I love to share, you know, what I've learned with with other members from our club. And, you know, and, you know, people feel free to ask me questions. And I do, you know, six or seven presentations, you know, a year in the club uh, just because I love to share so if you're not going to a, a society or a club, you're, you're missing out on a, on a really great opportunity to learn things. And, and so this, this presentation, which is somewhat abbreviated, um, is one that I gave to kind of help out the newer people who are struggling with, okay, I, I, what do I, you know, where do I start with a filter, you know, and, uh, and what good is it and what, what's the purpose of them? So, so I guess now I will, uh, Start the presentation. Okay. Uh, let's go. Love your image behind you. Yeah, that's my latest. Yeah. <laughs> it's not done yet. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, so this is uh, all about filters for astrophotography, uh, and you know as. As we get into this, for, for me, uh, if, you're, if you're not familiar with the portal scale, it goes from 9 to 0. 0 is great. I've never been there. <laughs> I've been to, been to 3 and 2. Um, but I live on a, on a, on a, a 7, kind of 8. Uh, when it's winter with the snow on the ground, it's an 8. Because <laughs> the light oh, yeah. is just Good shooting point. back up. Good point. Um, yeah, so, you know... If I, you know, when I'm shooting with narrow band, um, you know, with a luminous filter, I can do 20 seconds and I'm done. Mm. You know, there's so much light pollution that it just begins to wash out even at 20 seconds. But with, a, you know, the one shot color camera, which, you know, a lot of people are going to be viewing, you know, this Astro Chat series uh, might start out with or a DSLR, you know, you're going to want to know, oh, how can I battle the effects you know, of light pollution and, and sky glow and whatnot. So that's what this is about. 
So as far as a, a kind of a filter uh, overview, as far as how I learned it, um, you know, like I could talk to some, some, some guys in my, in my club and they could just talk circles around me with math. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I, I, I just can't keep up. So for me, it's a kind of a trial by uh, trial by error, trial and error kind of concept. And I've owned a lot of filters. I've learned a lot of things of what not to do <laughs> and what to do. Um, and the, the filters aren't on the list aren't important other than to show you that, you know, I've, I've dabbled in, I've, I've learned quite a bit uh, by experimenting with these different filters and different wavelengths. Astro imagers will go that narrow band route, you know, with uh, having the different types of filters in the front with a filter wheel. <clears throat> but the broadband one, you know, is basically your one shot color or with your DSLR. Um, and those simply are just red, green, blue. Now, the red, green, you know, green, blue, you could end up with a a uh, one-shot color camera in, in my skies, I could probably get away with like a minute before I start battling the light pollution without the filters. And with the narrow bands, it, like I mentioned, it's even less than that, unless I'm shooting, you know, for these deeper uh, wavelength kind of uh, uh, signals. So for narrowband filters, uh, when you hear that term, basically you can think uh, nebulae. That's kind of what they're going after. So uh, the purpose really is to, is to capture that, that beautiful HA in you know, red, uh, which is in the red spectrum, the O3, which is, is still in the red spectrum and the sulfur, oh no, excuse me, the sulfur, sulfur two is in the red and then the oxygen three is is kind of in that greenish blue area. So, but when we use the filters, we're going to try and find filters that can remove the, the human made light and, and any sky glow that may be there. The, the thing with filters is, you know, it's, it can be quite costly. Um, especially you get in the narrow band when you want, uh, you know, seven different filters, L, R, G, B, you know, L being luminance. Yes. <laughs> and then those three that I mentioned before, you know, it, it, you know, you're talking about a couple hundred bucks for these uh, narrow band filters. And then, you know, so it's, a, it, it gets quite costly. Um, then, the, but the advantage of the one shot color, of course, is you're going to just use the one filter. And depending on your type of tar target, you may only have to use that one filter. And, and guys, feel free to interject with questions too as we go along. You well, I can attest to how expensive they are. I got I've got chroma filters. Oh so, yeah, <laughs> Patrick. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh no. That, but you know what? Those filters are probably the biggest invest. That's the one biggest thing that I've spent money on. Is I've got two inch. LRGB and HA uh, S2 and O3, three nanometer, two inch filters. So yeah, more more than the AM5. You're gonna get maybe you tomorrow. Know, uh, yes. Oh, yeah, about three yeah. times. Wow. Yeah, they were they were like twelve hundred bucks a piece. They're expensive. Wow. Yeah. Well, but, here it is, fourteen twenty at OPT. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Right that's there. the five. That's the yeah. Five. I think. I think I get. I think they've gone up in price. When I bought them, they weren't fourteen hundred. They were just under twelve, I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the, the filter set. set at five nanometers. So you know. Oh, hey. okay. Yeah. Then yeah, I'll say that each one I think was just under twelve, and an LRGB I got as a set. I think those were like another twelve. So, but, yeah. So yeah. Case in point. <laughs> yeah. But the good news is, if you're starting out, you don't you don't have to worry about that. Right. right. Oh no. I mean, I still have. I still have my Optolong filters and yeah, those absolutely. work, but you just that, that, uh, Oh three, you got that super halo. So, I mean, it's, that's just tough to deal with. Right. Right. Hey guys. Um, let's take a little break here. I'm sorry. We were, uh, talking, I think about your filters, Patrick. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. So, just got done uh, yeah, talking about those expensive filters. Right. And and those filters really is what they're doing is they're they're narrowing down the band and thus narrow band of you know of uh, the sections of light that we want to capture. So in this this particular filter it's really not important whose it is. But what it's trying to do is capture the red, green, blue while cutting out the, these man-made lights. So that what you see in the orange would be, uh, could be uh, sodium vapor that are in the streets or, or certain LED lights. Uh, uh, so the idea there is just we want to capture just what we want to capture. We don't want to capture all the other things. So... Going back to my example earlier, where I can only take very short exposures with a good light pollution filter in front of my one-shot color camera, or even the DSLR when I was using it, I can do three-minute exposures now, and then I can start to get you know a little bit better data. Now I could still shoot you know multiples of of one minute and, and, and get kind of the same effect. But, you know, that's a lot of files and a lot of, lot to process. So that's generally the idea of these filters. You're just trying to filter out the bad light. Yeah, this uh, was the direction I went, uh, you know, not knowing what I, I didn't, you know, not knowing what I didn't know. Uh, at least I heard that if I'm going to be trying to image in, uh, Portal 7, 8 skies, and maybe a monochrome camera and filter, uh, narrowband filters might be a better uh, path for me. Uh, so that's kind of just uh, the reason I went that direction, only to find out later that I'm actually am imaging from 3 plus and uh, 4, uh, Portal 4 skies, because uh, my backyard was constricted by redwood. So, uh, you know, I, I got a van and then decided to travel. So. But huh. yeah, I, I, that's interesting. I wasn't aware of that. I thought you were always uh, shooting from what, like like Patrick and I were about, from your home anyway. No, no. Um, I would like to shoot from my home a lot more. I know. Yeah. And um, I'm going to put the effort in to do it. Um, but uh, you know. The object is only there for a short period of time. My field of view of the sky is very, very limited. But uh, I, I built something into Stellarium uh, that profiles the horizon that I see from where I have my mount. And yep. so that really helped me a lot to understand uh, when the target would be uh, viewable. So, um, but yeah, it's a challenge. Uh, and I think yep. I've been spoiled a little bit by getting out where you got more of a 360 uh, degree view of the sky, in particular above 30 degrees altitude. So, yeah, yeah. my 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 whole southern sky is blocked by trees and neighbors' houses. Yep. So, uh, all the good stuff in the summer, unless I go out for a club site uh, or somewhere else, you know, I can't get it. So, uh, yeah, mine the same way. Yeah. So here's here's an example of you know this is I, I'm not endorsing Ophthalm. Here, but they had the graphs, so I'm showing their graphs. Although I own and have owned all of these filters, uh, but you can see so from so, so if you see here, you see the mouse on the screen, right? Moving. Uh, yes, I do. You're on yeah, the uh, yeah, L extreme right now. All right. So here's the oxygen three. Here's the hydrogen alpha and the sulfur. So you can see, you know, this is the red spectrum over here, and then this is the blue green area over here um but uh let's start with so the l pro is letting in a whole bunch of light right and that's why these are good for you know general purpose light pollution and it's blocking those other ones um the l enhance which you know i still have um and love because although it's uh it's not as narrow as like the l extreme you can see if you look comparatively here, um, it does let in some light pollution, especially when there's a full moon, you're, you're capturing some of that. But I think it captures a lot more of, of other things that, that 
uh, the same time. In other words, I think the, the picture ends up being just as pleasing, if not more pleasing at times. Hmm. Uh, um, not to mention that it lets in the H beta for things like uh, the Horsehead Nebula, whereas the L Extreme cuts it out. Um, and then you have, and I just picked up the L, L Ultimate Filter um, and just starting to shoot with that. Wow. And this is the three nanometer. We'll talk about those wavelengths in a little bit. Um, so I sold my Elk Screen. I'll never sell my Elk Pro. <laughs> but I'm going to hold on to that too. forever. Because um, that's my workhorse is the Elk Pro. But anyway, uh, so there's lots of different manufacturers. You know, I'm, I'm trying not to be endorsing, you know, Optalon here. But they came out and went first and, you know, that's why I, I jumped on the bandwagon when I did. So here's a good example of why the L Extreme does a little better job in certain circumstances. Uh, this was a um, seven four-minute exposures on both of these. Chat with the 533 bill. <laughs> uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> we, we, it's so funny that how we parallel each other. Um but you can see the detail that's coming out in the L Extreme. You know, over here, it's, it's kind of, you know, you barely see it. And, but you're starting to see the filaments really pop, you know, with the same amount of time. So, um, you know, this is one of the cases where the L Extreme, to me, was winning hands down. And, and that is all because is the, when we talk uh, pretty shortly about the wavelengths, um, the L extreme is narrowing that wavelength down and they're cutting out more of the, the light pollution of sky glow. Hmm. So again, here's the, uh, you know, the bands that we want to capture in narrow band, um, except for the nitrogen. Yeah. I don't even know. I suppose we're picking it up, but I have no idea what it is. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't distinguish uh, it. But we're, you know, this is when, this is probably a little bit beyond beginner, but when we talk about the SHO palette, which is the, the standard Hubble palette they came up with for the Hubble telescope, they're just mapping those things in, into, the, um, into the red, green, blue. The issue why it's, it's a, an SHO palette is never really true color is because you've got sulfur and HA, which are in the red spectrum. So what are you going to do? <laughs> you yeah. got to put plug them in somewhere into our our eye RGB mode, which is what we see in. So you know they just chose to stick sulfur in red, the HA, which is still red, into the green, and keep the O3 in, in the blue channel because that's where it's closest. So what I had heard about the Hubble palette is that they chose that palette because they felt maybe some of the dust and some of the some of the uh, structures within some of these objects would be uh, brought forward a little bit more. I don't know if that's yeah. true or not, but I think so because you know if you've ever you know experimented with this, if you put the A chain in the red channel, it just completely overwhelms the 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 green and the blue of with the sulfur and O3 because the HA is so strong in comparison. You know, if you look at my background picture here, you know, this is all HA and the blue is the oxygen. Um, but if I were to put up just the oxygen, it, it's pretty good, hmm. but the HA overwhelms it. Um, so, you know, that's why that's another of the reasons that in addition to yours, uh, Bill, why why we do it that way? So let's talk now about you know what what that narrow and the narrow narrow is, right? <laughs> so you know when these filters start first started coming out, they usually came out in the twelve nanometer uh, variety, and it was pretty fantastic, um, you know, results compared to. Uh, just shooting with an IR cut filter, which is just taking out the infrared part of the spectrum, which is further to the right, if you imagine that chart, uh, than the sulfur is. Um, but the problem is to create these things, it costs a lot of money. You know, it's not just that they're trying to make more money, which they are. 
but to create a three nanometer uh, band pass, it's is, is very costly to produce. Um, so now I got a question. So if you're on a real dark site, you don't need to shoot three nanometer, right? You can go a wider because there's no light pollution you're cutting yeah. out. Is that right? Yeah, and that's uh, actually my last uh, picture will kind of uh, illustrate that. Um, actually, it's in the next slide. Um, so that's a really great question. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, the, so the 12 meter, 9 nanometer, if you, you follow along with like how these filters have grown, like the L Ultimate came out first, and then there were some other, uh, you know, follow on companies that, that brought theirs out. Um, and the, the, like the L ultimate is in that, uh, nine and 12 nanometer range. And then if the, you know, the aim is in the seven nanometer range and now this L ultimate, you know, that like I just described that I picked up is in that three nanometer range. Mm. So you have to shoot a lot longer with, with the lower the, the nanometer of those band pass goes, but the quality of the product ends up being a lot better. Uh, let's see, anything else I want to say about that? I guess, I guess before, before we go on, you know, if, if you're thinking about, okay, well, what do I do? Um, I, my recommendation, I'll ask you guys what you think. Is just get a good light pollution filter, uh, whatever that is. And um, you can research cloudy nights, or you can take my word that I, you know, I love my L Pro. And uh, I've had people try and say, "Hey, are you going to ever sell that?" You know, in my club. And I'm like, "Nope." <laughs> right. Yeah. But I have the L Pro, other... and I have the L. The uh, which one's it? The L Extreme? No, the one before that one. L, oh, just the uh, H-A L, uh, and yeah, the L enhance. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I've yet to, I, I have the L extreme. Once, once I got the, uh, five, three, three MC pro, I went with the L extreme, but I don't try to shoot RGB with my one shot color here, but I guess that's where the L, uh, pro yeah. might yeah. come in. Andy, that'd be a good decision. Maybe to add that. Right. And again, I, I don't want to get people locked in on Optalon because there's other companies out there with good sure. stuff. Sure. Yeah. And if it's just do a little bit of research and, uh, you know, and there's plenty of good videos out there of people trying different filters and their results. And, oh, yeah. Quiv's uh, channel. Now he's been testing filters and he's had some, some new filters that were just off. They weren't what yeah, they said yeah. they were. It, it's, it's not a simple thing uh, getting into these. Especially when you get into these narrow bands and fast scopes, um, you know it, it, it does tend to oh, play the, a little the shift. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but okay, so you know, Patrick had mentioned that what do you want to shoot with when you have dark skies? So here's uh, I'm going to show you what is the uh, Iris Nebula. It's a you know a very famous nebula. And it's a circumpolar nebula for those of us in the northern hemisphere. In, in Cepheus, however you pronounce that. Um, and so I did it for eight hours from Batavia, which is, you know, my portal 7-8 zone. And then I was at a star party in uh, Upper Michigan, which is close to a portal 3. And I didn't use a light pollution filter at all. I just used the IR cut filter, which is just, you know, taking out that, like I said, that uh, red spectrum from way up, up there. And the uh, it just helps clarify the picture a little bit, uh, the shots a little bit. So I did, it was less than four hours. So, you know, it's a pretty decent result for, you know, for, uh, you know, a light polluted skies. You can see some of the dust around yeah. there, which is really, this is like the third time I've shot this. And I've, that's what I was trying to get after here it, from home. And it looks decent. But look at the difference that you get from a dark sock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You get, you know, beautiful shades of the dust, and that's what I really wanted. I wanted to see not just the dark, you know, that the one on the left is so drab, um, 
but the, you know, you're just seeing the you know light dust, the dark dust, um, as well as the beautiful what, nebulosity. What do they say that uh, dust is a major uh, is predominant? Is the major element predominant in the cosmos, but it only represents one percent of the mass, or something? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, well, dark dark matter and dark energy. Yeah. 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 So when yeah. you when you say IR cut, does that do anything for UV uh, as well? Yeah, it's a, it's a UV IR cut. Okay, got it, got it. Because that's uh, I recently when I got my five three three MC one shot color camera, I did get an IR cut uh, for it. Uh, so when I'm in a Bortle three plus or four, uh, I use that. Um, yeah, that's that's and you should and yeah. you know if, and if people do planetary work, you should definitely be using. Yeah, at least that or, or some other type of stuff. I'm not a planetary guy yet. I think maybe next year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a whole other animal. It, it is. I mean, I got some some members in my club that just... I I should get Walter to come on here. Uh, Walter Torres from my club because I did talk about planetary because he does some amazing... He does the animation. Uh, anyway, I'm, <laughs> I'm off track. But... Um, so, so, yeah, so that's just the kind there, of the general... There is level. no off-track on Astro Chat. Yeah. So if you're watching and you're thinking about volunteering out there, don't worry. Don't worry. There is no off-track. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so... But that's the general overview of the filters. Um, I only had uh, showed half of the slides that yeah. I put in. I think... Yeah, is there a link... Did I give you the link to? Yeah, I did. I think you did. We'll we'll make sure that gets in there. I, I've been spreading that link all around when I see someone new asking about filters because, uh, you know, I thought I you know there was good information in there. So, uh, want to do? And that. I mean, truthfully, the filters are one of the most important things you could use because you don't have a filter. You go out there and think you can take these beautiful images, and all you get is light pollution. Yeah. Well, yeah. That, after the mount come the filters <laughs> yeah pretty much you know i um uh, i did a video called uh dark sky why darker skies matter or something like that and i was reluctant to do it because i didn't want to steer people away from starting uh you know and you know there are ways to mitigate the light pollution both through the use of filters and also then cleaning up some in the uh image processing perspective so I really didn't want to put people off in a sense, but but I know if I can get to a Bortle one one hour of work, it could take me maybe eighteen hours under my yeah. uh, Bortle seven eight skies. Yeah. So you That's know it's fair. like, but you know it's a hobby, right? So we don't have yeah. to uh, we don't have I to mean, be in a hurry. All the all the images I've taken have all been from my backyard, which is Bortle eight nine. I've never been out to I've never been out imaging other than my backyard, so. Yeah, that's my, it, my it, goal for this like, year. You have, you have a full time job there, Patrick, right? Oh yeah, but I yeah. mean, I use Nina, so I mean, I as long as I have a clear night, I'm imaging while I'm sleeping. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a whole that would, that could be a whole another <laughs> story, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I I don't yeah. I I always wake up when the uh, time for the meridian flip. <laughs> I used to do that too. You know, I just I just don't have the confidence yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just let I. I think I watched it one time, and that's it. And I got a, I've got a Wise Cam, those little security cameras yeah, that too. I got, and I would just watch it one or two times. Now it's like I just, oh yeah, go to sleep. I'll have sequence start at eight o'clock or nine o'clock, but by then I'm already sleeping. Yeah. Have it, everything shut off by four a.m. and get up in the morning, cover it up, and off to work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. now once you get your AM five, there's no reason not to. Oh, I know. That lightweight mount. <laughs> you'll be going out. You're you're gonna yeah. you're you're gonna need to go. So um, so if if I if I could only so say I am a one shot color camera owner. Let's just pick the five three three MC Pro. What are the two? Are there two filters you'd recommend that are would be good for a beginner? Uh, one for on the RGB side and the other on. Uh, the oh, narrow yeah. band. Well, uh, I, it's uh, that's really a depends question. Okay. Uh, yeah. It depends on your sky, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you're in a border, maybe even a four, five, and below, 
I would just go with an IR, you know, UV IR cup filter. Okay. And you save some money too because they're not very expensive. Um, uh, but if you're in light pollutants, guys, then you're going to need some sort of a uh, all-purpose light pollution filter, um, whether it's astronomic or Optalon or IDS. I think makes some or something. IDS. Yeah, I, yeah. I, had to, I struggle with IDS. One of IDS is trying to get the green out, but that may have been because I was in Photoshop. I was just learning Photoshop, so that was years ago. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So um, and then. On the narrow band side, I often hear people say, well, get a dual band. You know, you got HA, you got O3. There isn't a lot of uh, S2 out in the cosmos. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that's that's how I, I went. You know, my first uh, dual, dual band was the Dell uh, Enhance. That's all there was. <laughs> you know, at the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and now now there's a bunch of companies that, that make these dual band filters um but yeah and 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 that's fine and they're you know i think the l enhance is 200 200 bucks i think it's I in think that the range enhance and the l extreme i think it's a little more than that yeah, yeah. L yeah. Extreme is like 289 i think 279 or 89 for my l extreme yeah. yeah but it really is an investment i think that's worth it you know if you're if you love to shoot yeah, in Nebula, then, you know, you're going to probably want it uh, eventually. Mm -hmm. I would still recommend just just shoot with, you know, the basic UVIR cut or, you know, uh -huh. or filter. I did that for a year before I got the, you know, the dual band filter. Because um, there's, you know, in the winter, you don't need it. You got, all you have is galaxies. Right, and open clusters and, and globular clusters, and the, and the filter is useless in the winter, yeah. um, at least in the northern hemisphere. Uh, so, so yeah, um, yeah, the light pollution filter should come first. That would be my recommendation. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm going back and forth on my 533 MC Pro on whether I should keep <laughs> it or not. And right now, I don't have the money to do anything anyway, so because, uh, <laughs> So it's kind of a moot, mute or moot uh, thing, but um, well, you know the the nice thing about the five three three, um, especially if for the you know that was my first uh, astro cam, mm -hmm. and the reason it was really good is I think that square sensor, although you lose you know some aspect to it, the rotation doesn't matter. <laughs> Uh, it, it really is a nice kind of zoomed in feel. So if you have like a small refractor and you have the 523 sensor, I forget which one it is, you kind of get that exaggerated zoom that that you want to get. Um, and it's and it's has no amp glow, which I hate. <laughs> and yeah. I struggle yeah. with it still. And um, then with that, if you're using that one and then you do buy the 2600, since it's the same pixel size, you can use all that data. And crop, I mean, if you wanted to crop down that 2600, you could use right. all that data and bring out a ton of detail from older pictures. Yeah. Yeah. I had to choose between uh, 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 renovating a bathroom or, or 2600, so my wife won. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah my, uh, you know, I think that could be a show in itself in that, uh, <laughs> you know, it's... Uh, uh, but I mean, I was fortunate. I had a lot of stuff in the garage from prior har hobbies, and that I was able to sell that still had some value. But because mm -hmm. they were from prior hobbies, when my wife saw me getting involved with this one, she says, "Well, you know, you only stick with it for a little while, and then you move on." And I go, "Oh no, I swear, I swear, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> yeah, stick with it." But my, you're I told the wife the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is my I'm, retirement hobby. This is one of yeah, my keep yeah. for forever. Yeah, right? the. Um, I only recently brought up what could my wife see herself moving to get to a better backyard that wasn't as tree constrained. You know, I really don't mind imaging underneath the seven, eight skies because there are ways to mitigate it. Yeah. What, what just bothers me a little bit is my uh, field of view right now. And, yeah. um, you know, that's why, um, uh, I would never discourage someone that finds themselves in a urban city setting from, uh, starting the hobby because there's ways to deal with it and uh don't let that be uh be an obstacle to you right yeah. 
and especially sure. now with like PixInsight, Bill Blanch and he's come up with these pixel math plugins or whatever they're called. Yeah. Where I mean, you, you can do amazing work with those things, right. and it's so simple. All you do is drag it and drop it onto your image, and boom, it brings out the colors. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a show in itself. Uh, various tools that you could use for yeah, uh, yeah. image process. Do you have a a preferred tool, Andy? Or well, yeah, I'm a, I'm 100 percent fixed insight now. Yeah. yeah. Um, but when I was um, when I was doing DSLR, uh, a very un well, I shouldn't say unknown, but little known tool is um, oh, now I'm going to forget its name. Oh, do I have it on my desk? Of course. When you want to think of it, it's never there. And as soon as you turn the show off, boom, it pops into your head. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> It's, I, I, I rarely use DSS. Uh, oh, Sequador. That's what it is, or Sequator. I don't know how you pronounce it. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, I've heard, I've heard the name, but didn't uh, ever uh, Yeah, it does an absolutely it. beautiful job stacking and color it, you know, uh, taking out light pollution as, as part of the stacking process. And it's, you know, it's a free tool. It's a small download. Uh, a lot, yeah, of, my, a lot of the club members... Uh, use that for their uh, DSLR work. Hmm. I think Trevor Jones did a video on that. Yeah, he probably that did, yeah. Backyard, Astro Backyard. Yeah. 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 Uh, Peter Zelenka did one, too, on it. Um, I yeah. don't think he's a name for his channel, but that's, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah it's a really powerful tool, and it's simple, which is great for somebody who's just getting started. Yeah, I yeah, uh, was. Pixinsight can be a little overwhelming when you first start with it, but the thing with Pixinsight is a million YouTube videos on everything yeah. you want to see on it. Yeah, well, I, I did say for for Pixinsight, I don't, you know, um, again, Bill, I did <laughs> I did the same thing you did. I went to Adam Block. Yeah, Adam there. Block yep. Studios. Yeah, did the same uh, thing. I, I bought into I think two of the masters of the Pixinsight series. I did one, but. Uh, yeah. Uh, but then it was just, you know, it, it's just one of those things. It's an investment it's in time. Yeah. You know, the money wise, it's, I think it's a bargain over time because you pay for it once. Yeah. But yeah, I, I probably have watched a couple hundred hours of YouTube videos, not to mention out of block videos. And, oh, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Easily. Yeah. That's, uh, I, I thought that was money, uh, well spent, and um, I like that there was data sets there that you could work with, do the exercises, right. and um, and uh, I tried to make the argument the other day that actually, before you even uh, buy any gear and open up your wallet, learn how to image process. But <laughs> I I don't think there's very many people do it that way. But uh, yeah. Yeah. You well, know. that's that's kind of you know one of the things I did before I bought my first or my second scope, because I had a real cheap, you know, this is, uh, what do you call those? Those refractors that started with the Z 30 years ago. Um, oh. uh, anyway, I, I forced myself to, uh, for two months to memorize sky, sky charts. Oh, and wow. even though I was buying a go-to scope, I, I thought that, you know, and that has paid off through the years. I still remember I would star hop the places if I have to. Uh, yeah, and I, I don't regret that at all, even with all the technology options. I'm still glad to be able to find my way around the sky with my eye, you know? Yeah. See, no. where I'm at, I can't see enough stars to do that. I mean, I can make oh. out Cygnus. I can barely see Pleiades yeah. and Orion. And, I mean, those are the ones that stand out. Yeah. But, yeah, that's... Well, if you happen to go to a Portal One Star Party, sometimes it's good to be able to sky hop so you can find yeah. your way to the bathroom and back. But you know, <laughs> right. so, oh, I'm okay. Over... But uh, you know, but uh, all right. Well, um, any other things we kind of want to uh, chat about? I mean, I think we touched on a bunch of things here. I mean, how does a beginner uh, start to processing? Uh, I, I would. I would think that the one thing I would want to share for, or two things I'd want to share for somebody who's getting into this hobby. Um, number one is do it for yourself. Don't look at other yeah. people's pictures yeah. and, and say, oh, mine are crap. 
and don't I, I I I force myself when I look back at my work five years ago, I I, I refuse to say out loud that they're crap. They were yeah. they were pretty good for where I was. Oh, um, yeah. And you know don't don't do it because people praise your work or whatever. Do it because it's self fulfilling. Um, the second thing I would I would say is embrace failure. Yeah. Uh, I remember your video on, on you always giving up, Bill. I quit. I quit <laughs> astrophotography. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I, I, you probably don't remember, but I left the comments. Is, no, you know what? You have to embrace the failures and, yeah. and learn from them. And, yeah. you know, and it might require having a workflow and recording your steps and stuff. But, hey, you've learned something, you know. You, right. That's the thing yeah. is a failure isn't a failure. It's a learning experience. Yeah, so I, I don't mind failing failing at all. Um, even even now, I occasionally have meridian flips which fail, and you know I'm like, okay, I'll try and figure out what it is, but I don't care. You and know? usually, it's always something that we've done. It's nothing yeah. like you hear everyone say, "Oh, Nina did this and Nina did that." It's like, nah, I bet you it was something yeah. you set up that was wrong. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, it, one night I forgot to tighten the clutches. You know, yep, so that's oh, wow. in my workflow. You know, it's like okay, tighten the clutches down. <laughs> and I've gained a lot by sharing what I'm doing through this channel. I've gotten a lot of help from people uh, helping yeah. get me uh, redirected and right decision, including last night, where this Robin Brown. Um, I showed a couple of images of where I was trying to improve back focus and. Uh, he gave me a bunch of pointers, um, and he thought I was about right with my back focus and not necessarily uh, my field of view My was relatively flat, so not really where tilt would be a major concern. But he thought something was going on with my guiding where maybe my mount was not. But I was thinking too, Bill. Yeah. yeah. So those type of things are, are gold mines, but if you don't share, you know, don't, don't think you're there by yourself when you're encountering into something. Reach out. And, of course, those were things like uh, cloudy nights and stargazer lounges uh, are, are good forms. But I think when you're part of an astronomical society or a club, you can reach out to one of your club members that you've built some confidence with. You can, you can have that face-to-face -face or, you know, telephone conversation or whatever and, and leverage your knowledge and uh, help you get over... Uh, your uh, your challenge and on to the next challenge because it will like always be one more. But and, uh, and you know what's interesting? I think of every every club I have ever visited or seen or watched stuff online, it's built into the DNA to want to help people. Yeah, which is very you know it's it's very unusual and and people love when you ask questions. You know. Um, so, yeah, if you're not in a club, you're just starting out, I would really, really, you know, recommend, you know, doing that. Yeah, no, I, I uh, what do you call it, evangelize uh, uh, participation? Because <laughs> I remember on my first trip, I decided to join a club that was 473 miles away, their dark side. But that's, <laughs> another, that's another story. It was my <laughs> excuse to tell my wife I needed a van. But uh, anyway... Uh, one of the first people I met was a guy with a 25-inch and a 22-inch Dobsonian. And, wow. you know, he started to teach me the sky. Yeah. You know, because what do you do all night when your camera's clicking away and your mount's moving and all that? And things I saw, you know, the live photons was just phenomenal. And, you know, I, I built a, a good friendship with him and good conversations. And that's, he really started my interest in, wanting to at some point get a visual telescope yeah you know to spend some time out learning the sky uh, more and like you say how welcoming the people were i was just really blown away because i'm i'm kind of introverted and i don't naturally mix and those type of things but it was just so comfortable and uh so anyway you know but i realize that you know there's many reasons why people may choose not to but if there's something in their area uh, they they should do it and uh, and even me being all the way up here in the club holding uh, meetings down south uh, at least they used to be over Zoom because of COVID and all that so you could participate uh, through that means and see some really good presentations 
uh, like your presentation for the Fox Valley Astronomical Society. So, but yeah, good good stuff. All right, I don't know. We're uh, coming up on uh, maybe an hour. I hope uh, hope the audio is good. <laughs> oh, I forgot to do it again. <laughs> I, I have a feeling we are going to do it again, but maybe on a different topic, or uh, you know, and uh, maybe when we get um, Charles Bracken on or something, you know, we'll we'll just have to see and then uh, work up that episode idea that you have, uh, Andy, and uh, and uh, you know, make that happen as well. All right, well, Patrick, you know. We need to start seeing some videos from you on your AM5 and your uh, ASI Air Plus. Yeah, well, I got to I got to figure how to get out of this thing first since I just got it turned on. Now it's just it's just sitting there. It's like, so what do I do with it now? Oh, okay. <laughs> That's that Android or Yeah, it's on my phone, but I'm No, not Android sure. phone. Or... That's yeah, a big display. On... Yeah, yeah you got you got to swipe up from the bottom. It's really annoying. So how do you how do you turn it off? How do you get out of ASI Air? without well there should I mean, be a switch right there should be something like a red box yeah. up on the top where you can get to your controls to turn your ports on so there's a list of icons generally starting about midway on the left side yeah, yeah uh yeah from the right across you got like a a guide camera oh, wow. telescope oh right yeah 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 yep. so, so there should be something i think uh before your main camera icon. Oh, whoop. I think I got it. And then if you scroll down the bottom, there'd be like restart, shut down. There we go. Yeah. Hey, look at that. Learn something new. It's a nifty, it's a nifty platform. It is. Yeah. yeah it's, it, it, it looks pretty cool. Yeah. But, but like you, you, you Bill, I, I am, I'm a Nina all the way when I'm home. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to plug it in, just check it out. But once I get yeah. down here, I'm going to go plug my mount back in. When, when I go to cold sites, it's, it's ASI Air, always. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. I can see that for sure. Yeah, well, I'm going to, I'm still going to invest my time in Nina for my Edge HD and, uh, and see what the differences are. And can I get a better focus with the algorithms in Nina and in particular to plug in Hocus Focus? versus what's available on the uh, ASI Air. I mean, yeah. I don't know that yet. And so these are some of the things that I want to try uh, to uh, yeah. try to find out. I, I think so. I th this is just an opinion. It's not scientific. I think it's a little better with Nina, with the Hocus Pocus. Yeah, that's what I'm uh, I'm, I'm looking to, to give that a try, you know. And I think ultimately what happened to me with my uh, B-Link was maybe uh, maybe it wasn't getting enough power. So I'm, I'm really not... Uh, Sure, sure what happened uh, with my nuke uh, that night and uh, but I've been running it all day and everything oh, seems okay. stable and everything yeah, yeah. so you know uh, I was going to go out there tonight but then the clouds started coming in again so uh, you know that's the other thing <laughs> that's why I'm looking forward to Lee Poulin and getting the perspective of a UK imager you know yeah, I, I, I make us feel better yeah you know so <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we're excellent. Gonna, we're going to drag this out if we keep going. <laughs> yeah. Well, we should probably uh, start to wind it down. Excellent uh, presentation, Andy. Thanks for uh, getting engaged, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna have to do this again. And uh, yeah. you know, I think uh, every anyone out there, whether or not you're willing to come on and be a part of the chat, if you have topics that you'd like to uh, see discussed. Uh, Put them in the comments, and I'll collect them uh, in a in a spreadsheet, and we'll try and get those topics covered. But again, I think this is an opportunity for you to invest some of your time. Come on, uh, share with people at the front end of their journey uh, three to five tips that you learned now that you're further down the road that might be helpful to them, so that they can learn through your experiences, and we can help uh, continue to support the beginners and uh, or novices or or let's let's just say people new in this journey. I kind of got this thing about a beginner. See, I'm an advanced yeah, beginner. Know. At 68, I've begun many things in my life. So, you know, I, I do bring with me a certain formula of starting things that has, you know, helped build some success. So sometimes when I see people comment about, oh, the beginner should do this or the beginner should do that, 
uh, okay, but, uh, you know, I think uh, it all comes down to how much experience you have beginning. Uh, anyway, all right. Other than that, I don't know uh, what to say. Uh, if you like this kind of content, please give it a thumbs up. As always, look in the video description. You'll find uh, Andy's uh, links. Uh, so you can, uh, Andy, you got a blog. Uh, I think, right? That was one of the yeah, links. Yeah, I'm trying to be more active than that. And, and the purpose of the blog is really to record what I'm doing to help other people. It's not yeah. else. Yeah, and, and again, that's the whole intention uh, of the Astro Chat series is to, to help and uh, share that knowledge. And uh, so raise your hand out there in the audience and come on. And if you're a brand new beginner and you're seeing this, come on. And we'll bring a couple of other people in and, you know, get some, uh, have some conversation about what some of the things that, you, that you're being challenged by and, and those type of things. So uh, that that could be a, a great uh, chat as well. So, all right. Well, again, I talk forever if I don't stop. All right. <laughs> like Simon uh, Lewis said when we were talking in pre-interview, uh, he could talk the legs off a monkey. So, oh, not a monkey. Yeah, a <laughs> mule. Uh, a donkey, not a monkey. <laughs> he could probably talk the legs off a dog, a monkey as well. All right, everyone. Uh Wherever you may be in the world, hopefully you have clear skies. Uh, if you like this kind of content, give it a thumbs up. Always hit the notification bell and subscribe. Other than that, till next time. Yeah, we'll see you later. See you later. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, guys. All right. Yep.